You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. When I first started to recalculate what our budget actually was going to be, I cried. <laughs> it's terrible. That's Erica, a 30 year old living in Toronto and working in advertising. Over the past year, she's been planning her wedding. When we first got engaged, our budget was $50,000. As it stands today, it's looking closer to $75,000. Yeah. The first sign of trouble? Finding a venue that could hold all of their 150 guests without breaking the bank. The venue that we landed on was supposed to be about $10,000. We're getting married on a Sunday, which is supposed to be cheaper, but it's a long weekend. We found out at the time of signing the contract that we would be paying Saturday rates, which means that it's $15,000. And so there's just a lot of costs that kind of creep up on you. So this is the key here. Those creeping costs or hidden fees, as Erica also calls them, were the second sign of trouble. Things can pop up from anywhere. Things like finding a rabbi on the busiest day of the year for Jewish weddings. We had originally budgeted about $300 for an officiant, but now we've gone up to $1,100. There are all sorts of surprises, like the AV setup. I got an email a few months after we signed our contract with the venue saying that if we wanted an AV setup and music for the ceremony and for the cocktail hour, it would be an extra... $800. It's easy to see how Erica's budget got so inflated, but in fact, she still has sympathy for the vendors. She just wishes they were more upfront about their pricing. It's very frustrating to get a contract that has a price that's totally different from what you talked about. My fiance is really great about, he'll just be like, well, it's another 200 bucks for this really important day. And I really appreciate that he says that because it makes me feel better. But the truth is when you keep adding up all of these little $200 expenses, all of a sudden you're $25,000 over budget. <laughs> $25,000 is a full 50% more than Erica and her partner wanted to spend. Every single line item came in over budget. Now, as couples are planning next year's weddings, we wanted to know, is this normal? Was Erica ripped off by her vendors? Is the wedding tax a real thing? When the price of everything is in flux and your event needs a little bit of everything, how do you afford a wedding in this economy? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings, and yes, you're listening to In This Economy, a show that helps you understand the systems that create our money problems, from grocery bills to mortgage renewals and weddings and everything in between. In every episode, I talk to a person facing a real financial challenge and then find an expert who knows intimately that area of the economy and can explain the factors behind the money and offer, if not perfect solutions, and options, things that you can do, even in this economy. Let's start with the average cost of a wedding in the greater Toronto area. On the low end, I would say about $65,000. $65, According to this week's expert, Shalini Masir, she's been planning weddings in both the Toronto and Thunder Bay areas for over 16 years, working on everything from small, intimate affairs to massive galas. I started by asking Shalini about the crux of Erica's problem, those hidden fees that keep adding up. Just how common are they when you're planning a wedding? I think a lot of times we have to remember that couples, this is generally their first wedding. So they're learning along as they're planning. Whereas vendors, we've planned hundreds and sometimes thousands of weddings. We forget that couples don't know what's going on. So... The little fees that I think where couples are surprised comes from, you know, even just moving from a ceremony to a reception. And I'll speak as a decorator. Sometimes the the quote will be based on, say, 135, because that's what you told them. And now it's up to 150. 
So that final number that you get after your invitations have been received, that will change things. And then if you have to switch between a ceremony and reception, and you've only given the decorator an hour, where maybe when you originally spoke, they had a few hours, now the fees are going to go up because they have to bring on more staff for less time. Definitely a lot more work. Those are details that you wouldn't know as a couple that is going to absolutely increase your bottom line. One of the things that kept coming up, though, was not fees coming from changes, because I think everybody should understand that, right? If you were quoted at 135 and you come back and say, I need 15 more meals, 15 more chairs, whatever, that's going to be more expensive. But things like, oh, you're actually being charged for the sound equipment that you don't need, or you're actually being charged, you must pay for this DJ if you're going to book in this place, or fees that kind of come out of nowhere um, that have nothing to do with changes requested by the couple. Where do those come from? And and maybe you just don't even think about them anymore because you do this so often. But what are those? I mean, I've been working in Thunder Bay for the past eight years. I know every single vendor. I know how they work. And I know what their expectations are and where their charges come from. Now, if you're looking at a larger city like Toronto, you can't always know what every everyone is going to charge. These fees, I find sometimes are just not, it's the vendor not being open with what costs will incur. So for example, um, there are venues that insist on using their DJ or their equipment. And if another DJ comes in to use their equipment, there's a plug-in fee. A plug-in fee? A plug-in fee. So you're plugging into their DJ equipment and therefore you have to pay for that. They don't always tell you that off the bat because that'll scare you off. Have these fees always existed? This feels very modern to me. I think what's happened is that We've always provided the service. It's just that we've never charged for it. So as time has gone on, we've tried to, you know, everyone knows that weddings can be expensive. So they've tried to lower their baseline fee to kind of really win. And then they say, oh, oh, you're doing a wedding cake. Are you bringing it in? Are you cutting it yourself? Or are you, do you want us to do it? So those are the charges that they bring in after the fact when we've always done it. They want to reel you in. Right. This is like when they uh, give you the manufacturer's suggested retail price for a car and it basically comes with nothing but the engine and you got to pay for the extra tires and the air conditioning and the radio and whatever else is in there. Absolutely. And this is not the case with all vendors or venues. Absolutely not. But it is something that I've seen before. So, you know, there are some venues out there that are happy to provide absolutely any and everything for you. Once you've paid, you might have a higher rental fee to begin with, but those services are automatically included. Have you ever heard of the wedding tax? The idea that like people expect weddings to be expensive. People know going in kind of like this is going to cost, I don't know, 20, 50 or more thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And the vendors can kind of slide those extra fees in because they know that they are providing what people at least are going to prepare to view as a premium service. And to your point that they're not going to understand it. Right. I've had many clients say, you know what, we're just going to, for example, on the cake, we're going to order a cake. We're not going to tell them it's a wedding cake and it's going to be cheaper. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're ordering a birthday cake, for sure, it'll be cheaper. But if now you're going to say you want the design to be upgraded, that's what costs money. Do you want someone to put the same time and effort that they would in a birthday cake or in a wedding cake? There's definitely time and energy and detail that goes into a wedding that wouldn't go into something else. I've heard people call it a wedding tax, but it's not so much that it's a tax. It's just that it's the attention to detail that goes into it. A wedding is an event. It's usually indoors. It's got a lot of people together in a crowded space. Has the pandemic increased the costs there? So I'll speak from personal experience. There were a lot of things, like I said, that us wedding vendors didn't charge for. We just kind of included it, lump sumped it into our costs. And then when the pandemic happened, we realized that, for example, I didn't charge to replan anyone's wedding, which took a lot of time, Hmm. a lot of time. And sometimes I was replanning a wedding two, three different times over the course of two years when that wedding was supposed to be back in 2020. When you're spending all this time and you're not getting paid for it, it starts to eat at you. And a lot of vendors have started to start charging for those extras that they would have included in their original price, but they just can't anymore. Then we're also looking at the pandemic has increased the cost of flowers, of purchasing decor, if you are a decorator. So those costs have to move over to the client. It's still a business and we have to make sure that at the end of the day, we're making some money off of it. 
So I don't necessarily think it's much of us charging more because it's post pandemic, but charging more because I think we value our time more. You know, it's it's kind of funny the the wedding industry. I'll speak as a planner. I give a lot of my personal time away to my clients. And then when the pandemic happened, I really started to value my family time and I really enjoyed that time. And I wasn't willing to give my evenings Hmm. and my weekends off to clients anymore without being paid for it. So that's, I think there's been a shift in the thought process of the way we charge. You seem to be getting at the general cost of living and the cost of inflation, which is something that comes up repeatedly as we try to explore how to navigate stuff in this economy. What I would like to hear more from you about is how do you manage the expectations of that or the budgeting of that while being kind of the middle person, right? I understand that you're paying more for flowers and food and everything, but you're also then going back to the client and saying, well, this is costing way more than we thought. Sorry. Like, how do you navigate that relationship? I mean, the first thing that I do is when I speak to uh, clients is to say, you know what? If you're booking your wedding one or two years in advance, you have to understand that prices are going to change. There are some things like services where maybe, for example, a photographer, a DJ, they can keep their prices the same for you. So when you book them now in 2025, when your wedding's happening, that's the fee that you're paying. Then there are the services that also involve items, for example, decorator, cake, catering, that kind of thing. And I explain to my clients that We are unfortunately in a flux. We don't know what the cost will be. So what we do is we book vendors based on their talent, their portfolio. Do you like these people? Do you like what they do? And we can get an estimate. But now we're saying estimate. We're not saying this is your final number and this is how much it's going to be per person. We can't do that anymore. If when we get closer to your wedding, maybe one or two months out, and we finalize those numbers with, the, say, flowers, we're ordering flowers in, then we can give you a final number. And if that number doesn't work for you, then maybe we have to shift a little bit of your design to fit your budget. So, I mean, we are planning sometimes a year, two years, sometimes three years out. So we have to be more flexible. And I think we have to explain that to spend a lot of my time explaining to my clients the flexibility. And there tends to be this vendor versus client mentality us versus them. And I'm trying to bridge that gap to say, you know what, they're, they're doing their job. You are going to say what you want. And ultimately you control what you spend. If you don't want to spend it, how do we change your expectations or the look so that we can only spend what you're wanting to spend? Do you find that the level of trust is changing as you have to navigate all this uncertainty in terms of pricing? Whenever we talk about basic items and inflation, We keep coming back to, you know, greedflation, which is people seeing higher prices. And I'm not saying that that's the case here or anywhere, but people see higher prices and it's natural to assume like, okay, that person is making more money and that can cause a a loss of trust. Absolutely. I think when it comes to the wedding industry, there has always been a little bit of a mistrust of just it. Oh, it has the word wedding in it. Therefore, it will be a lot more expensive. I think it truly just comes down to communication. We need to be able as vendors to break down our costs and explain. I mean, I can speak as a wedding planner. There are some people who are just saying, well, this is my fee, take it or leave it. And then there are people like myself who will explain, okay, well, I'm charging this based on it being saying an outdoor wedding or a destination wedding, or you only have 50 people. So communication is really key on that. And I think that's where you start building trust and explaining so that in the the months, the years leading up to your wedding, you understand the process. You understand what's going on. If somebody comes to you like our caller does and says, I want to have a 150 person wedding somewhere near Toronto for $50,000. Can you promise them that you'll deliver that? Oh, absolutely not. (laughs) And the thing is, is that it may sound simple, but if you're telling me you have 150 people and you have $50,000, well, what do you want from your wedding? Again, this is where a wedding planner comes in. I start, my, my first question is, well, what do you, tell me what you would like to see for your wedding day. What are your expectations? What are your priorities? 
what doesn't matter so much to you? What happens if they answer that question with, well, my mom wants? Well, is your mom contributing to the bottom line? Hmm. That's that's a big part of it. And and if parents and grandparents are contributing to the wedding, then it's also, well, do they understand the cost? If mom wants a sit down dinner and she's going to pay for it, does she know how much it costs? I've had many, many fathers offer to pay for the wedding dress and are shocked when the gown is over a thousand dollars. Well, that's not um, what it cost in 1989. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it's again, it's managing expectations. And that's a big part of what I do. Um, explaining to sometimes the dad as the poor bride is trying on her dress and she knows this is what she wants. And she's calling dad for that credit card. And dad is losing his mind because it's he was expecting a couple hundred dollars. I mean, you can't even get a prom dress for that price anymore. The big thing is, is that clients have to remember they ultimately control their wallet. They decide what they want to spend. And it's not so much a bargain as to, well, I want all of this and I only want to pay this much. That's not fair. That's not the real world. What you have to say is, I have this much money. What can I get for that? Why do you think people are always so surprised at what weddings cost? Like, I'm, it doesn't even matter if it's a cheap wedding. You could say, we did our wedding because we we have a family farm and we did it ourselves and we have a thing. We did our wedding for $10,000. People were still surprised it cost that much. People are surprised because they've never done it before or they were never fully involved. And my, my hmm. explanation is always, if you were inviting people over for Christmas dinner, think about the costs involved, right? I mean, when you have to buy all the food, you know, you're probably decorating a little bit. You're also buying all the alcohol now. And if you had 10 people over or 20 people over, how much did that cost you? Now multiply that till you get to the number of guests that you want at your wedding. That makes a lot of sense. My last question for you then is what's one piece of advice that you would give to newlyweds who are trying to avoid uh, some of these extra costs? So the first thing I'll say is you have to meet your vendors in person. I think you're going to immediately be able to build a relationship, a sense of trust of if you can trust them when you meet them in person. Don't go into anything with this negative idea that they're out to swindle you. That's not generally the case. Wedding vendors love what they do. They want to make the most perfect day for you, but they can only do that if you give them all the information. And they'll be honest with you. They'll tell you, you know what, that's going to cost a little bit more or, ooh, that might not be possible with your budget, but they'll also come up with suggestions for you. So if you are open and honest, they will be open and honest with you as well. And then there's a lot less surprises along the way. That's great. And are there specific questions that these couples should be asking the vendors to build more trust? So when they're newly engaged, I think the first thing to do is check out their work. See if you have questions right off the bat. When you meet them in person, ask them, have you worked at this venue? Have you worked with these other vendors before? What are some things that you can foresee that maybe we should consider with our budget? Does this include everything or could there possibly be additional charges? And whatever you have, whatever conversation you have in person, don't be afraid to reiterate it in an email and send it to them. I think anyone who, you know, wants to make sure that they're protected, loves a paper trail. Um, but ask those questions. You don't know what you don't know. What am I not considering here? Is there something that you would suggest that I do? It's okay to walk into a meeting and not know what the first thing is about flowers. Give us a chance. <laughs> don't just assume that we're out to get you. We want to know what you need. In the end, Erica and her partner were able to cover the costs of their wedding, but would they do it again? I'm okay with it, and I'm trying to get comfortable with it, but I also don't need all of this. <laughs> but knock on wood, hopefully I'll never have to do this again in my whole life. Well, hey, I hope Erica doesn't have to do it again either. And if you are planning a wedding or thinking of planning a wedding and you want to avoid those hidden costs and extra charges... Here's what you do. First, meet your vendors in person. These are going to be important people throughout the entire process. So just make sure you like them and feel like you can trust them. Second, be upfront about what you want and what your expectations are. This includes vendors, obviously, but also friends, family, anyone else who will play a significant role in the day. 
Communication is important, especially when you're sticking to a budget. And third, regarding sticking to that budget, don't be afraid to ask questions. Ask your vendors if they foresee any additional charges between signing the contract and paying the bill. And get that answer in writing so you have something to back you up down the road if they do show up. And finally, remember, not every vendor is out to scam you. They are people too. We are all just out here in this economy trying to make a living. Thank you so much to Shalini for sharing her wisdom and for being our expert on this episode. And thank you to Erica for talking us through your money problem. If you've got a money problem, we definitely want to hear from you. We can maybe, possibly, hopefully help with it. You can email us at hello at itepod.ca or you can call us and leave us a voicemail. The number is 416-935-5935. Remember to let us know how to call you back. We don't need your real name to put you on this show, but we do need your real numbers. You can find us on Instagram and on TikTok at In This Economy Pod. I am your host and executive producer, Jordan Heath Rawlings. This episode was written and produced by Stephanie Phillips. Sound design was done by Ryan Clark. Story editing was done by Ali Graham. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. And together, we are the Frequency Podcast Network. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk next week on In This Economy. <laughs>